Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brendan Teeling, and on behalf of Dublin City Council, oh, sorry, did I say something wrong? No, no okay. Uh, I'll start again. Good. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brendan Teeling, and uh, on behalf of Dublin City Council, great pleasure to welcome you to the Dublin Festival of History. Uh, big welcome to those of you who are here in the room with us, and a big welcome to those of you who are watching online. Um, just want to also thank our uh, ISL interpreters, Vanessa and Cormac. And while, while I do that, I would also like to take this quick opportunity to thank all of the crew involved in putting on the festival. Uh, we're, we're, this is our last event here in uh, TCD at the big weekend. But of course, we have another two weeks of events around the city, and uh, you all have a copy of the programme, so there's lots more to come to. We just want to say a uh, big thanks to the, the libraries team and the Dublin City Council culture, culture team, and the video crew, and the sound tech, and all of the people in the blue t-shirts. I won't try and name names, but I just want to say on, on our behalf and the City Council, great thanks to all of them, doing a fantastic job, so well done to, to, to all of you. I should, I should say they're not all wearing blue t-shirts, but I won't try to describe them by their dress, you know, because I could, I could get it wrong. So look, we've had a fantastic uh, two days here at the festival, and uh, we're going to go out on a, on a really high note, uh, welcoming back Sarah Churchwell for her second appearance here. Sarah is a professor of American Literature and Chair of Public Understanding of the Humanities in the University of London, and she was here before uh, talking, about her, talking about her book, Behold America, uh, A History of America First, and her latest book is The Wrath to Come, Gone with the Wind and the Lies America Tells. And also returning to the programme is another festival regular, Sarah Carey. Sarah is, uh, many will know, is a columnist, broadcaster, and communications consultant, and we're really delighted to have Sarah back again. In fact, they met the last time at the festival discussing Sarah uh, Churchwell's latest book. Delighted to have them uh, repeat. Uh, so please welcome Sarah and Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, and you're very welcome. Um, if you see me checking my phone during this, I'm using it for time because the clock on the wall is broken, so I'm not checking my messages because uh, I'm a little bored by the talk. Um, quick check-in with everybody. Is there anyone who has not seen the film Gone with the Wind? Okay, we've one or two. And is there anyone who has not read the book? Okay. That will be important. Um, so Brendan has given Sarah's uh, formal qualifications, but I'm very familiar um, with her work. And what she's exceptionally good at is naming things, which is what the psychologists tell us to do. And um, you know, showing us that the myths and things that seem benign are actually quite dangerous. And I think she's phenomenally brave and, and forceful for the way she argues um, how you know, history is that nightmare. I think you say in the book um, from which we can escape, although sometimes you do actually wonder. So it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you here to, say, uh, to the festival, Sarah. Why did you write the book? Um, well, first of all, thanks so much um, <laughs> for those very kind words, and, and thanks for the, um, to the festival for inviting me to, to come back again. I had such a wonderful time last time, and I'm really, really glad mm -hmm. to be here again. And, um, and yeah, this is a book that, I, um, that, I, that I, I feel really passionate about, and, um, and, I, and I, I feel it has some things that, that I thought needed to be said. And, you know, I'm an American who's lived um, over here, this side of the Atlantic anyway, I'm in London, um, for over 20 years. And since Trump, basically, I, I, I literally get asked, like, every time I go out, I am asked by people, what the hell is going on in America? Like, literally every time, like, I'm meeting a person, like, what is, and, you know, and then all the way through Trumpism, and that question got more and more urgent, and it was more, everything was getting crazier and crazier, and everybody's going, what? So every time, I was like, please explain this to me, you know? And then the insurrection happened, and, um, and it was clear to those of us who study American history in depth that there were, um, that there were what, you know, what we could think of as through lines, that there were continuities here. Um, but, for, but for everybody who doesn't study American history in depth, it came out of nowhere. It was just absolutely out of the blue. I mean, what do you mean they're storming the Capitol and trying to overturn an election in the United States? And of course, I'm not suggesting that I was sitting there going, oh yeah, that was, I predicted that, you know, I mean, obviously none of us saw that coming in one sense, but when it happened, we could make sense of it because of the ways that it was invoking past aspects of, uh, you know, the, the, um, um, these details of American history. But anyway, it's a big and complicated story. It's 160 years of American history going back to the Civil War at least, 
arguably longer. But you have to understand it in terms of, of the Civil War at a minimum, in my view. And I just thought so many people didn't understand what was happening. And then it was like, well, how do you pull all of this stuff together in a way that is coherent and is manageable, not just for me, so it doesn't become like a 20-year project, um, but also for the reader. And as people were talking about it, it was clear that, that Gone with the Wind kept coming up as a shorthand for explaining some of the ideas that were being invoked in the debate and the discourse around American politics today. And we'll get into why that is. But I, Gone with the Wind is a, is a book that I, um, well, I grew up with it. I grew up with the film, I should say. I was obsessed with it. I, you know, I was like trying on hoop skirts and I wanted to be Scarlet and played Barbie dolls as Scarlet and I loved the movie. And, and then I ended up teaching it. And so it's one I know really well. And when people started invoking it, I thought, well, actually, there's a lot more going on in this story than people think there is. And there's a kind of superficial hot take, you know, that they're going, oh, it's gone with the wind. And I was like, well, actually, if you sit down and you think about really carefully about everything that is happening, the, the history that goes in and the myth that comes out of Gone with the Wind, you could tell the truth about what's happening, but you could do it through the lens of Gone with the Wind, and that would be a new way to try to think about this story. And it seemed to me the more I thought about it that, that there are two reasons for doing that. One is that Gone with the Wind, although many people here haven't read it and a handful haven't seen it, um, it is still the most popular, most successful movie of all time um, when adjusted for inflation. And it is still one of the most popular American stories of the 20th century by any measure. And it, and it continues to shift around 300,000 copies a year. So it, it remains incredibly popular. So even for people who, who don't necessarily engage with it, it's out there and it's part of a conversation. And the other reason for thinking that it was, that it was worth doing is that is that it seemed to me as a, as a student of literature as well as of history that I wanted to think about the ways, about the myth in particular and, and how myth and history are in conflict and tension and in relationship with each other and dialogue and argument and debate. And then how the myth started to shape the history, how it started to change the history. And so it's, it's also about the power of fiction. And so I wanted Gone with the Wind there to help me think through the power of fiction and storytelling. And we'll get to the history, but I think it's important to state that, you know, this isn't some revisionism. The movie was very controversial upon its release. Yeah. And the treatment of the black cast members was controversial. So tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And it, as you say, it's an important part of the story. So, um, and it's also, I think, important to say that, you know, I didn't write a book to be like, I've got a newsflash for everybody. <laughs> Gone with the wind is racist. You'll never imagine. You know? so, so that's kind of the starting premise, right? But I think that, um, I think that one of the interesting things about, exactly about its popularity and, and about the conversations around it is is that so it was published in 1936, instantly um, uh, optioned by David Selznick to turn into a film, and then the famous film released at the very end of 1939 and then really began to be distributed in 1940. So that's the moment that we're talking about, 1936 to 1940. And so we might think, oh, they just accepted the racism. They like, didn't even notice the racism. They thought it was like fabulous. But the novel uses the N-word more than 100 times. And when Selznick, and it does it in the name of historical realism, but when Selznick was adapting it for a screenplay, a huge controversy erupted around whether they should be using the N-word in the screenplay in a way that is very, very relevant to the kinds of debates that we have today. And, and what it shows is that the things that we think that we have brought to history, often we haven't. You know, we do tend to patronize the past, you know, to be like, oh, we've discovered you know, progressivism and liberalism, and they were all benighted you know, 100 years ago. And it's, and it's not true. And it was mostly African Americans, of course, who mm. were. Um, who were arguing against it. And they understood very clearly, and as I say in the book, that's because they understood it experientially. It was not a theory, it was a reality that that word is linked to violence. And they knew that when that word comes, racial violence follows. And, they, and so they kept saying, you cannot do this. You'll start what they called a lynching holiday. They said this will be an incitement to lynching. You must not use this word. And there were debates about how to censor it, to redact it. They used the phrase, the N-word, already at that point as a euphemism. So, and I was interested as a, as a student of language as well. I was interested in those debates around language and about, again, how it gets us to, to rethink some of our received wisdoms and, and our assumptions about this story and about the past. Um, and at the premiere in Atlanta, Georgia, the, the, some of the black cast members couldn't go? None of the black cast members could go. So it was, um, 
you know, Jim Crow segregation was still uh, um, very much alive and kicking, and particularly in the Deep South, and Atlanta was a segregated city. And they were celebrating the, the legacy of the Confederacy. They were celebrating slavery. <laughs> they were. Mm -hmm. And part of the, um, the, the, uh, the consequence of that um, during segregation in the, in the 30s and 40s was, of course, that there were whites only and blacks only. It was an apartheid, effectively. And, um, and, and the, the city was segregated. The black cast were not allowed to come to the, they weren't allowed to come at all. Um, and they, they certainly would have been invited to the premiere. And one of the um, stories that I tell in the book, um, which I've been, I've been wrongly credited with having discovered, and so I feel I should say in public, I didn't discover this, but I think it's an important story to include because it's certainly not well known, is that the night before the premiere, they did this gala for the cast and the crew and all of the dignitaries in, in Atlanta, who of course by definition were white. So all of the, you know, the great and the good and local officials. And they put on this pageant where they had like a backdrop of like a fake plantation, you know, and it was all very gone with the wind, like you, you know, the, like the, 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 the scenes we have in the movie. And they brought out a, a choir to sing, a, a, um, a children's choir from a local church. And they were 10-year-old uh, African-American children and they dressed them as slaves. The word they used was pickaninnies. And they dressed them as slaves so that they could sing for the white cast because it would be so cute. And one of the 10-year-olds singing was Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. Mm. And, 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 it's, and it's that. It's to understand that, these, that, they're, that, that this, this is not ancient history. This was all happening within our, our memories, our parents' memories, within a couple of generations. And Hattie McDonald, yeah. who was nominated for the Oscar, because I think a lot of people might think that that segregation was just in the, in the South. South. But at the Oscar ceremony in L.A., she had trouble getting to the, the they Oscar were, ceremony. They were not going to let her in. So she became the first African-American to win an Academy Award for her performance as Mammy. And the, um, the, the Academy Awards that year was held at the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles. And exactly, that was also a segregated, it was a whites-only club. And, um, and they were not going to let her in. And David Selznick had to insist on it. He pulled strings. And he finally got her into the club, but they would not let her sit with the rest of the white cast. And she had to sit at a table by herself against the wall while, the, while, the, while Clark Gable and Vivian Lee sat at a table in the middle of the room. And then she had to go up and get her, uh, and get her award and then go back to the table by herself. And all of this in a story that was insisting that slavery had done no damage to America, that was saying that the, the, that was saying that black people welcomed being enslaved, that white people were nice to them, that it was all kind of fine. And what were we also worried about? And why did the North have to come ruin everything? Because it was actually really lovely. <laughs> and, and, and that is the attitude that, that Gone with the Wind takes to slavery. And of course, it's not unique in this. It's, that's partly why I wanted to use it, because it's very representative of a, of a, um, of a version of American history that takes this view. And, um, and, and so, and it's like the, nobody wanted to do the math, you know, of like, oh, it was all fine, except, you know, well, black people aren't allowed anywhere, but, you know, other than that, you know, and it's just like, so, and, and, and it is important, as you say, for people to recognize that segregation was across the United States. Mm. And it was in Harlem. It was in Harlem. So the, um, the Cotton Club, the famous Cotton Club in the 20s, everybody thinks of it as this mixed race paradise where black and white were dancing together. Black and black. Black people were dancing on the stage for the entertainment of white people, and they were serving white people, but they could not come as paying customers to the Cotton Club in Harlem. So I want to wheel back round to that yeah. and about what you call a mutually agreed silence between North and South. But let's go back to the start then yeah. and the, the Civil War itself. So this is all about the lost cause. So what, what is the lost cause? Yeah. So what happened was after the uh, South lost the Civil War in 1865, um, and it's important to say that so the, um, when the South seceded, we have to go a little bit back to the beginning because the Lost Cause comes out of, uh, it is a, a piece of revisionist history. And the Lost Cause is a shorthand name for it, right? So it was a, it was a um, propaganda campaign to rewrite the history of the Civil War in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War in order for the South to save face. So what we have to understand, going into the war, the South was absolutely explicit about the fact that they were going to war over slavery. That was absolutely understood. It was in speeches. It was in newspapers. It was in the, the, um, the Confederate Constitution. So when they seceded, they wrote their own Constitution of the Confederate States of America. 
And in it, they said that uh, slavery could not be outlawed in perpetuity. So they said, going forward, you would not be allowed to outlaw slavery. And that slavery was, it was, they were mandating that it should be expanded as the United States expanded westward. What a lot of people don't realize about the Civil War, we think of it as being fought between North and South, which is true, of course, but it was fought over the West. And what triggered it was westward expansion and the debate over whether states, as they came into the Union, would be slave states or free states. And the Confederate states wanted to expand westward because they wanted more land so that they could have more slaves and they could make more money. It was an agrarian economy. And this is also you know, intimately tied in with the history of indigenous people in the United States. Because so then you, have to, you take the land from the indigenous people, and then you can force your way westward. And the fight was over whether you would have it was, it was known at the time as a fight over wage labor or slave labor. And the Republican Party of Lincoln was the party of wage labor, that people should be paid for their labor, and that that was um, about you know, kind of individual freedom and autonomy. And that was why Lincoln um, took the position that he did. Anyway, so the, so the Confederate states were like, we are pro-slavery. We are so pro-slavery. So Georgia, where Gone with the Wind takes place, was so pro-slavery that in its articles of secession, it, it, it uses the word slavery something like 35 times, I say in the book. I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it's in there. And, and it literally keeps saying this is over slavery, it's about slavery, right? They lose the war and they instantly say, slavery had nothing to do with this. We did not go to war over slavery. What are you talking about? We went to war over states' rights. We went to war because the North invaded us. We went to war to just defend our way of life. We were just minding our own business. It was a perfectly happy um, you know, community and the North were greedy. I love this one. This is my favorite one. The North were greedy and they wanted to come in and take everything from us as if, as they say in the book, as if slavery was like a charitable institution, you know? I mean, it is an economy. That's the whole point of slavery, right? They're like, oh, the greedy North. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you were being greedy by enslaving people to work for you. Um, and so, but they also invoked the revolutionary spirit of the founding of the United States. They said, we are just, we were rising up against a tyrannical overlord. And this should start to sound familiar to those of you who follow American politics right now. It's very much the discourse of Republicans right now. And, and that part, part has flipped. We can talk about the parties during questions if people are curious about that. It gets confusing. But anyway, um, it's a bit of a red herring. But, um, and so they, they wrote this deliberate piece of propaganda, whitewashing the immediate past, absolutely denying, flatly denying what had just taken place. It was a big lie. It was the big lie. And it was a big lie that lasted for 160 years in which they said it was all kind of fine and, um, and, and that, in fact, the South was noble. And they called it the Lost Cause because the idea was it came from you know, Walter Scott and other kinds of romantic texts who were really, really popular in the 19th century. And it was this idea that they, that they knew they couldn't fight the big overlord of the federal government, but they were going to give it their best shot and they were going to you know, nobly go to war to fight for their way of life. Right? Well, unfortunately, their way of life was race-based slavery. And that was the part that they kept not wanting to talk about. So, and in Gone with the Wind, that's what's embedded into it, that the slavery is off stage. Yeah. And you say that in Gone with the Wind, the slavery is not just romanticized, it's eroticized. Yeah, absolutely, it is. So, which is a, which is a kind of a complicated claim that I build up to. I mean, I can't just come out and be like, well, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, right? No, so, um, so it, it, but, but it's, bec it, I think that the, from my point of view, the, 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 the thing that I find so, so representative about Gone with the Wind is um, in its attitudes to the Civil War and to slavery, and remembering that it was written 70 years after the Civil War, is that it, it is, and I can I say this is you know, kind of typical of American history, is that it's entirely about people who were white slavers, that's what it's about. Those people are. That's scarlet and red. They are people who own slaves and defend it to the death. And, and it's entirely about a worldview that is built around slavery and around defending slavery and then pretends that slavery doesn't matter and keeps telling us that slavery isn't, isn't relevant. And yet slavery is at the heart of the whole thing. And, and it's that denialism, I think, that is really, for me, um, is, is, at the, is at the heart of the story. And what it means is that, um, is that there are ways in which the, the story's ideas about power get deeply embedded in racialized ideas. And eventually, because it becomes about power, there are these frissons. And eventually, in the story, it actually, be, particularly in the novel, um, 
there is this way in which darkness and race gets, um, does get eroticized because it's the site of power. But that's getting into, you know, um, kind of <clears throat> Well, bring us on to the view. reconstruction then. Yeah. Because I think that's where the, the real meat of this is, that, yeah. you know, Scarlet's goal is to get Tara back, to get back the life that she had. And how does that tie into, you know, kind of the national myth on reconstruction yeah. for this for the South? Yeah. Yeah. So so I think, you know, when we when we watch Gone with the Wind, and again, you know, I say this as somebody who loved it, right? I mean, I loved it. And I so identified with Scarlett wanting to save her plantation and good for her. And nobody's gonna, you know, keep her down and, and I'll never be hungry. I'll never again. be hungry again, you know, and and, um, and of course that is why it was so popular in the thirties, is it, you know, it resonated with people in the Great Depression to an extraordinary degree. So it's about resilience, it's about defiance, it's about survival. And so there's, so, so there's a lot to admire, and I think that one of, the, one of the ways in which the story is so interesting is that when we talk about it as a love story, we think of it as, as a story with an unhappy ending, right? Rhett walks out on Scarlet. For those of you who haven't read it or seen it, <laughs> apologies, apologies for the spoiler. <laughs> um, that's why he says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, as he's walking out the door. Um, but there is a happy ending. Um, because it's the real love affair is her love affair with Tara. And, um, and she gets to keep her house. And that's what she loves the most. And that's who she goes home to. So, um, the, and, and I think that's an interesting story in and of itself, this romance with the land, which, by the way, in the novel in particular, although those of you who remember the film will know the film does this as well, is very, very um, Irishized. Is it yeah. hibernized? I don't know yes, what, the, yeah. what the right word is there. Um, but it's, it's, very, it's very mythologized as, as inherently Irish, this love of the land, as her father tells her. Or Anyone, I, anyone with a drop of Irish blood, the <laughs> land is, you know, is in them, you know, is innate. Um, yeah. and, um, and so that all gets very, very naturalized and romanticized and, and mythologized. Um, but, the, but the key there is that, is that when, when we look at it from, uh, when we don't look at it from Scarlett's point of view, but we take a step back, which is what I try to do throughout the book, is just say, if we don't look at it from the story's point of view, but we look at it from the point of view, so, so this is a story that thinks that Abraham Lincoln is the bad guy. Mm. Now, as a student of American history, I'm not going to sentimentalize any US president. There are things that we can say that Lincoln could have done better, that we can object to in Lincoln. But he was one of our better presidents, let's, <laughs> let's be clear. He's definitely one of the good guys in history. Um, and, and this is a story that thinks he's the bad guy, right? So, so what I want to keep doing is stepping outside of the framework of the story and the perspective of the story and say, let's look at it from the point of view of thinking maybe Lincoln was right, maybe slavery was wrong. You know, a few, you know, kind of simple points of view like that, right? And so Scarlett's point of view is that she's the victim of the Civil War. Her view is that the Civil War destroyed her way of life, she was minding her own business, and the, and the terrible Yankees took everything from her, and she is going to do whatever she can to get it back. And that's the story's point of view. But if we take that step back into history, what we're talking about is people who were white supremacists who went to war to defend slavery, who lost everything and didn't have to pay a penalty for it. And the only penalty they paid was that they lost their human property. But they were allowed to keep all of their other property. And of course that included land. And what that means is that it's the foundation for the white South to rebuild its power and indeed to rebuild Jim Crow and the apartheid system in the 30s and 40s that we were talking about. So the fact that the, that the white slave owners, that you know, Scar in, in, in a just society, Scarlett should have lost Tara. <laughs> she should have. Her society went to war so that she could keep it and they lost. But she didn't lose her property. And so it's, it's trying to, um, to think through the consequences of that attitude. So, and I think you say that the North won the war, but the South won the peace. Will you go into a little bit of how Reconstruction was overthrown, yeah. as you put it? Yeah. yeah. So this is a, um, a complicated and, and terrible story. But again, it's, it is the foundations of Jim Crow. But in the, um, in the most kind of succinct version of Reconstruction, Reconstruction is the period that immediately followed the American Civil War. It was Lincoln's term for it, and it was supposed to be building it, the way we could talk about it today is it was what, how would they build a multiracial democracy after they emancipated the slaves? What would a, um, a, a multiracial democracy look like? How could you reconstruct the country to be a true democracy? That was the vision, and that was the, it was a radical goal. And it was actually a really audacious one as well to think that you could go from race-based slavery to full multiracial democracy in the space of five or 10 years. Incredibly audacious. It's actually one of the only things that gives me hope in the whole story. Um, is, is it failed, the United States failed um, to do that, but it tried. And there were people there who wanted to do that. And I think that's kind of great. Um, 
but it did fail. And it failed because white supremacists were not going to relinquish their power. And, um, and it failed because people in the North were tired and they didn't care anymore. And once slavery had been abolished, they kind of didn't care what happened to black people. So they, because they weren't anti-racist, they were anti-slavery. So they, a lot of them still believed that black people were inherently inferior to them. They just thought that slavery was morally wrong. But they didn't think there was anything wrong with white people, I mean, black people being oppressed in various other ways. And, then, and that's why segregation could travel through the country, because they thought that part was kind of fine. So, the, so the, the country reunited around white people agreeing that as long as slavery was over, that was the main thing. And then the North could get on with making money, which is what it wanted to do. And the South could get on with rebuilding the foundations of its power through race-based hierarchies, which is what it wanted to do. And so they basically, they, they recreated slavery in all but name. Could it have happened any other way? I mean, without the North militarily occupying the South, mm. you know, for a very long time, without the cooperation of the Southern elite, was it always doomed to failure? It's a really big and important question. It's one that, that historians of the Reconstruction debate. Um, and, and it's, you know, it is one of those big questions of what, what kind of, what counterfactual alternative history what might we have had. The thing we know for sure is that the assassination of Lincoln changed everything. We do know that. Okay. And there's no doubt about that. So that's kind of how I would put it, is that if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, it would have played out differently. But you're right, that because the white South was not going to just give up and be like, oh, okay, well, we lost the war, but now they can come and join our local governments. They were not going to do that. And that's why the first Klan was created. The Klan was not created in order to defend white women from you know, rapacious black people. You heard it here first. Um, it was created in 1866 explicitly, and I go into this in great detail in the book because I think it's so important. There's an enormous amount of documentary evidence from 1871, white Southerners who went to Congress and said the Klan was created, has been created, in order to stop black people from voting. That's what it's for. They were very explicit about it because they were white supremacists. So they didn't feel any need to hide what it was about because they believed that black people shouldn't be in government and they believed that black people shouldn't be voting. So they were like upfront about it. And Ashley is the head of the Klan. He sure is. So in the novel, it's very explicit. Ashley leads the Atlanta Klan. He is the head of the, of the Atlanta chapter of the Klan. And when Scarlett's second husband, Frank Kennedy, is killed when he goes on a raid to get the men who assaulted Scarlett, which is very much that mythology of the Klan, the story that says that the Klan was, was created in order to defend white women's chastity, which again, it was not. Um, but that's one of the myths that Mitchell upholds. And, um, and in the novel, it's very explicit that both Frank and Ashley are members of the Klan, and that's why they go uh, uh, to get Scarlett's assailant, and Frank Kennedy is killed on that raid. Rhett is not a member of the Klan, and so sometimes people think, but that's his, you know, isn't that, okay? that's great. So he's like, that's his saving grace. Unfortunately, the only reason he's not a member of the Klan is because he's not a joiner. <laughs> like, it's too much of a club, um, but he's not opposed to what it stands for. And we know that, first of all, because he gets them all off the hook. So he saves Ashley and they all lie about how they were there. So he saves all of the old guard. But also because in the, in the incredibly famous scene, when Scarlett goes to see him in the dress made out of her mother's curtains in the green velvet dress, that for those of, uh, those of us of a certain age might remember Carol Burnett's spoof of it where she actually wears the curtain rods, which if you haven't seen, look it up on <laughs> YouTube really after this. Yeah. is one of the funniest scenes <laughs> ever, ever filmed. Um, so she forgets to take the curtain rods off and she's wandering around the curtain rods. Anyway, um, that's neither here nor there, but we need a laugh. It's a very serious story. Um, but um, when she goes to visit him, people often misremember that scene as if Rhett is there as a prisoner of war of the Yankees. Um, but he's not. He, the Yankees have imprisoned him because he lynched a black man. That's why he's there. And both the film and the novel are explicit about this, and he defends it. He says, I did, in the novel, he says, I did lynch him and then calls him the N-word, um, and he says he was uppity to a lady. What else could a Southern gentleman do? Mm -hmm. So he's a lyncher. He's a straight-up lyncher. Um, so unfortunately, we can't defend Rhett either, I'm afraid. And I just want to quote a little bit from the book on that because there's so much in here about the Klan, as you say, how they were really formed to, to overthrow uh, Reconstruction and that whole issue of white women and their supposed vulnerability uh, to black men. So this is Scarlett, um, you know, feeling very sorry for herself and, <laughs> and, 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 and really annoyed that the Yankees are, um, are punishing 
uh, clan members who lynched black people. So she's saying she could be killed, she could be raped, and very probably nothing would ever be done about it. And anyone who avenged her would be hanged by the Yankees, hanged without benefit of trial by judge and jury. Yankee officers who knew nothing of law and cared less for the circumstances of the crime could go through the motions of holding a trial and putting a rope around a southerner's neck. And you say the projection is so specific and spectacular it is difficult to see it as unconscious. Because that's what the clan was was doing to black people. To black people. That's what white Americans were doing to black people. And not just in the 1860s, in the 1930s, as this mm. novel came out. So one of the things that I talk about is that there were literally these um, um, public lynchings in 1936, 1937, 1938. Um, m m m um, people subjected to sadistic torture mm. that um, I won't ruin everyone's night by by um, detailing, but I do go into it in the book because I think it's so And in important. America First, you dwell on and that. And in America yeah, First as yeah. well. I mean, in Behold America, yeah, the previous yeah. book. Um, and um, because it is important that we know. Um, but the, um, so literally, you could be reading Gone with the Wind in 1937. It's the most, it was, you know, the biggest bestseller of the day. It's the book that everybody's reading. You could literally be reading that, you know, out, you know over your breakfast and then put it down and, and w in which Scarlett mm. thinks that and then pick up your newspaper and see the latest account of that exact thing happening to black people. It never happened to white people in the United States. But Scarlett has these fantasies over and over again where, where white people are, be, are the victims here. White people are being victimized. But it's, it's very specific. And it's one of the things that I realized as I was working on the book, and it became one of my central arguments, is that it isn't just the case that Gone with the Wind is, and that the lost cause more generally, which is, as I say, the worldview that it represents, it's not just that it um, denied the truth of American history, it's that its lies are, are just, they're very specific reversals. It's always the opposite. When it's, and, it's, and it's what Freud calls negation, right? So um, when you say, and I love this example, when the, the classic example of negation is that um, you tell the therapist that you had a weird dream, and the therapist says, what was the dream about? And you say, I don't know, but it wasn't about my mother. <laughs> That's negation. <laughs> so you introduce it by denying it, right? And that's what they do. They're constantly negating the truth. It's a tell, like poker, you know? So actually, if you want to know what really happened, see what they said. And, and I bet you good money that the truth in documentary history is the exact opposite, the specific opposite. And it, is, it, it often is projection. But aren't Rhett and Scarlett in the book, though, the pragmatists? I mean, they say this is a feudal system. It was never going to survive. It's a crazy war. It could never last. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's one of the, I think it's one of the saving graces. There are things about this book that I like, I should say, yeah. and, um, and about the story that I like and, um, and that I still find interesting and, um, and, and worthwhile. And that's one of them. It is, um, it is a book that has many, many objectionable attitudes. But um, it is not pro-war. Um, yeah, it's it is, an anti-war book. It's an anti-war book. Yeah. And it is interested in what happens to women in war, and it's interested in the home front in the war. There are no scenes of um, battles. For those of you who've read the novel, you'll, you'll remember that. Um, she doesn't go into, I mean, Ashley at most sends a letter, and he's always you know, mooning about, you know, <laughs> he never talks about battles. So there's no battle scene. He's such a weird object oh, such of her weird. desire, because he's, he's so late. Oh, he's I mean, so, it's so bizarre. Um, oh, good. And, um, but you know, again, yeah. so there's a, but an interesting, you know, there's so many kind of um, twists and turns, as I say, of how fact and, and, um, and mythology intersect in this story. And of course, Ashley Wilkes is, you say, a really weird character, but one of the um, sort of poignant and, and, and tragic connections there is that the actor who played him, Leslie Howard, was born Leslie Howard Steiner in Upward Norwood, Upper Norwood, London, and he was Jewish. And he died fighting uh, Hitler. Um, so he went back to join, um, the, he went back to join the, the cause. And, um, and, and so the, um, but anyway, yeah, he is, a, he is a, a weird one, and I got distracted because it always- Sorry. Um, so <laughs> I what would, that. Remind me what your question was. Um, um, well, actually, going back to, you were talking about how it's anti-war. Oh, yeah. And, um, and, and, and it's-, it's and, and the and pragmatism. It's from, that you know, someone you said, about. this is a movie and a novel that very unusually is from the female gaze. Yeah. You know, it's solely through the perspective of women's experience of war. So to the extent that Eleanor Roosevelt, at the time the book came out, said the novel made the lingering enmity of the South easy to understand and that she sympathized 
sympathized with the women of the South. I think you then call this, this is relatable Southern women. You yeah, know? exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So these relatable Southern women who didn't want to give up their slaves. Yeah, but that you know? was unusual, to be fair. No, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. But that's the point, is that is the way that point of view, that perspective got naturalized. It got taken as ordinary. It got taken as perfectly, even by white liberals in the North, like Eleanor Roosevelt, who was an actual liberal. Right, yeah. um, but but who just couldn't see past it? Who didn't suddenly go? Wait a minute, she's a she's a defender of slavery. She's a white supremacist, right? So the, the, we never just stop and say to ourselves, wait a minute, these people are just straight up white supremacists and pro-slavery, and that's the whole worldview that the book is defending. So yes, yeah, so you were asking about the, the you know Rhett and and Scarlett have mm -hmm. the, do have these redeemable features because they are more modern, and so they're basically 1930s characters who got parachuted into an 1860s setting, and Scarlett in particular. Well, you know, is she a feminist hero? Well, she's not, a, sorry, that's why I say 1930s. Yeah. She's, she's, she's not a feminist hero in ways that I think that, you know, certainly not that I would want to, I would want other, I wouldn't teach okay, my so daughter to I, be I, more I, like Scarlett. I, I think um, that I'm quoting you on this. She's <laughs> courageous, she's obstinate, she's forceful. She faces what reality she can see without flinching, which I yeah. think is a good way of putting it. And she's <laughs> profoundly loyal. Yeah. And, you know, she uses men. Yeah. Uh, there are lots you know, of things to like to, about Scarlett. Yeah, to yeah. get what she wants. Yeah. So yeah, there, I feel there are aspects of her that are feminist, absolutely. Yeah. But she's purely selfish. Um, she doesn't really care about other women except in so far as they also advance. I mean, she wants to keep Tara. That's what she cares about. And if women will help her do that, that's fine. It's, it's you know, she, she fantasizes about Melanie dying all the time. I mean, I'm not, just that she can steal her husband. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, that's not like a feminist bumper sticker, is it? Um, but, but, you know, but yes, but there is a lot to like about her. And I, and I very much hope I do justice to that in the book because I want to do justice to my own love of her, you know, as a girl and why she meant so much to me. She is resilient. She is a survivor. Mm. Nothing gets Scarlet down. And, you know, and, and what I like about Mitchell in, in, her, in respect of Scarlet, she's very clear-eyed about that. She's actually quite ruthless in the way she depicts Scarlet. There's actually a very funny uh, yeah. quote Mitchell was funny. <laughs> about um, Mitchell deliberately writing her as a bad character <laughs> and then being absolutely appalled when she became so popular <laughs> and that this showed that the Americans had a very bad mental and moral attitude. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. know, she, she like, didn't mean for her to be like. No, she was an anti-heroine. So, yeah. I mean, she wanted her to be appealing but problematic. And so, like, a, you know, a modern anti-heroine. And so... She's, she's in the, very much in the mold of Becky Sharp, for those of you who know your Thackeray. Um, she's, she's very much a Becky Sharp character. So, um, you know, the rogue that, you, that you're not supposed to like, but she's actually the most interesting and everybody likes her the best anyway. And, um, and, and then the good, sweet twin, mm -hmm. who's, you know, uh, Melanie in Gone with the Wind, who's supposed to be the good girl, but is totally boring and insipid. And, and really nobody irritating. Likes her. And totally irritating, and nobody <laughs> likes her, you know, and everybody likes Scarlett. Yeah. So, um, including Rhett, right? And, yeah. so, and I also think that their battle of the sexes has aged quite well. They are equal partners, and, or equal combatants. They're not partners, but equal combatants. And the novel's actually very, very cynical about, Rome. it is not a romantic novel. Mm -hmm. For a novel that is a story that people think of as the 20th century's great epic romance, it is so cynical about love. It is so cynical about what happens between, uh, a, a, in a marriage, um, between men and women in this case, but um, about how, how love can wear out. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it, where, where it's tragic is, is, that, is that it is about, you know, that Rhett's, Rhett's love is not undying, that people can destroy love. And, and that's, there's a very adult worldview in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's, um, I realized at one point as I was as I was writing it that you know when I was younger my attitude to it was okay it's racist but yeah. and then there was the stuff that I liked and now my attitude is it's racist and and there's the stuff that I like okay so let's bring it into the modern day and the the lies that are in it that you think you know are at the root of the caustic politics in America today so so what's in there that's being leveraged now yeah so what I, I mean, really, I think the whole book, and you can see it's, it's, um, it's not a short book. It was supposed to be a short book. It did not end up a short book. Easy read. Um, She's a good yeah. writer. Oh, thank you Don't very much. Don't be scared. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I tried really hard to make it, yeah, to make it, it readable, it so that's read. good to hear. Yeah. Um, um, but it's, um, but uh, all of it really is trying to answer that question. Yeah. Um, is everything in it is, is, to me, is contributing to the political situation that we're in now, and all of it 
to me, speaks to where we are now. The sense of white grievance, the sense that white people are the real victims, the sense that, um, that, 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 uh, that multiracial democracy will take something away from white people. Um, and it's a history of division. You know, we're good at telling the stories of the unity of the United States and how it came together. We're not good at telling the histories of and, our division. I, I think that's a really good point because you saw that straight after the insurrection. Yeah. And this was the, the post-reconstruction argument too, that division is the worst possible yeah. thing. Unity is the thing that matters most and therefore justice should be sacrificed yeah. for the case. Exactly, yeah. unity at any cost. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and I say at the beginning, and I th I'm a child of divorce, so I think I can say this. I said, <laughs> so basically, you know, they, they, they just say sweep everything under the rug and pretend that nothing went wrong and that didn't work better than it would in any divorce, right? You can't have a civil war and then pretend that there was, that you don't get to the root causes and then just stay together for the sake of the children. I mean, that's basically, you know, what the country keeps doing is, well, but we won't actually get to the, to the root of the matter. And so, what happens is, is the unity is fake. It's, it's deeply, deeply superficial. There's a paradox here. <laughs> and um, and, and it, that's why it keeps breaking apart. And so it just gets papered over. And then any, anything that actually um, inflames violence or, or, or makes clear the divisions, and it, and it inflames again, which is, which is what happened with the insurrection. So that sense of grievance that the South had about the North, you say grievance is the politics of narcissism, the refusal to shift your ground, nursing your grudges, building spite into politics while telling your enemies to move on. So is that what you're saying is happening now? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was very much thinking about yeah. uh, American politics today when I wrote that yeah. sentence. Yeah. That, and, and, and Britain, you know, I live in, I, I live in London. Um, <laughs> That, that, that I'm seeing the two, the two democracies that, that I am a citizen of and that I vote in and that I know best are turning spite into a system of government. And spite is no basis for a system of government, you know? Yeah. And, and so I think it is about, um, again, it's about understanding these divisions and seeing that if we, if we know what their long history is, then maybe we can start to recognize what it really will take to reconcile if we can. Um, and, and to say that you can't just shrug and move on, it just doesn't work. And that ability to tell the lie about the past, if this extraordinary quote in it about an Alabama senator, Tommy Turberville, and about his father in World War II, oh, just yeah. tell us. <laughs> so Tommy Turberville just became a senator uh, in 2020, incoming senator, the highest, you know, other than the presidency, one of the highest offices in United yeah. States politics. And um, he announced that um, he was like, proud to be joining the government because he was going to join the fight that his grandfather had fought in. His grandfather fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He did. And Tuberville said, um, like his grandfather, uh, who went to Europe to liberate Paris from the socialists. Yeah. <laughs> and communists. And, and co communists. Yeah. Yeah. In the yeah. Battle of the Bulge. I mean, it's so historically illiterate, right? Yeah. And so, that, but it's... And, and, it's, and it's so ideological, right? So that history, because I say in that passage, I say history becomes whatever you want it to be. But it's specifically your, your ideology. So fascism gets overwritten because they want socialism to be, and communism yeah. to be the enemy. And, the, and, and that's the other thing that I wanted to get at here and why I think it was um, important to tell this story and what Gone with the Wind to me brought to this understanding of American history. The, the final third of the book is about um, gone with the wind against the backdrop of the 1930s, um, but thinking about it, which has been done before, but only ever in relation to the Great Depression. And I wanted to think about it in relation to the rise of fascism, because it entered into a debate in the United States about American fascism. And that is one of the other things that we have erased. So the subtitle, The Lies America Tells, is not just lies about slavery, not just lies about the Civil War, it's also lies about American fascism, about our own fascist history that we just suppressed and denied. And there was a history of fascism in the interwar period. It didn't take power, but we had fascist movements in the interwar period. And so one of the things that I did here was try to excavate those. And it turns out that when you go back and read the debates about Gone with the Wind at the time that it came out, people recognized that it was fascistic and that it had these fascistic um, sympathies and, and, and in a complex way. It is American fascism, which is not the same as Nazism and not the same as Italian fascism, but it had affinities and it had a, a, a through lines. And, I, and, and you, know, you get to a point where Tommy Tuberville is saying that his grandfather went to fight communism, and that's what happens when you suppress the truth about fascism in your own history, when you, when you get to the point where... So the whole idea that in the Cold War, the United States recast itself as only ever fighting communism, 
And there's clearly now, because they voted for him, there's a whole tranche of Americans who believe that communism was only the only enemy that the United States ever needed to fight, the only political battle we ever fought, the only ideological uh, um, contest. And, and, that, and, and that's partly, in my view, we can debate this, but in my view, that is why they are perfectly willing to, to embrace fascism now. And they don't even have a problem with it. Yeah. I mean, so more and more, they're happy to use the word. You know, and, and of course, we're seeing that in, in Italy with, um, mm -hmm. with Maloney, right? Where, mm -hmm. where fascism is being rehabilitated in front of our eyes. And it's this kind of rewriting and denial of the past that enables that to happen. I can throw it open to the floor now. If Sorry, on that cheery. Anybody, <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Oh, great. So we, we could talk about Carol Burnett, too. And if you just hang on one sec, we'll get a mic to you. Oh, sorry, I should have warned uh, the staff first. <laughs> so don't sprint down those stairs too fast. Uh, right here at the front. And then is there anybody else who want? Oh, great. And then the lady here with the gray hair. And then I'll come over to you then in one sec. So um, this man here first. And then the lady. Sure, yeah. Kind of behind them, if hi, you want. Sarah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, we've been in touch with uh, yes. uh, Julia Bookshop in Westport. Yes, we were hi, nice targeted to see you again. by the fascists <laughs> ourselves. Oh, yes. Proud Boys Island, believe it or not. Why? That's Why were you targeted? Uh, we had a drag story. Oh, that's you. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I had to come and say hello. Yeah. Well, hi. Thanks for yeah, coming. Yeah. Love the book. And well done for having a drag story. Yay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you know. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. As, as I think I said on, on Twitter, I believe if you're being targeted by fascists, it means you're doing something yes, right. Yes. <laughs> or my dad tells me I've got all the right yeah. enemies. So, yeah, exactly. uh, you know. but, so, yes, I mean, like, fascism is, is here in Ireland. Uh, Ireland's kind of sleepwalking into this, which, you know, there's not a real big conversation about it, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully um, it's, it's a minority. Yeah. Uh, but it's there. So do you have a question? Oh, no, no. Okay, well, Hi. nice to meet Thanks you. Thanks for coming. And I'm sorry, we let this lady just beside him, and then I'll... Or do, uh, I just wanted to say, when you, thank you for the talk, um, and you mentioned about the rewriting of history, and just now we're hearing about the far right in Ireland. Ireland. There's both the past and the present where Irish perceptions of what they are abroad is, is quite divergent to what the real life is. So the first one is, there's been this notion going around for years that Irish were slaves themselves, mm. the enslaved, and it's a, you know, a far right theory that the Irish here are very much maintaining, the, the far right group here, whereas there's ample evidence that Irish were slave owners. Mm -hmm. They got money when slavery was abolished. Mm. Uh, they were in the Caribbean. If they did go over, they went over as indentured servants, which is a completely different thing. They were not property. It's, it's another, it's not exactly right, but it's not, it's a completely different entity to slavery. And the other part is they were fundamental, and I use the word fundamental, in the way that white supremacy could operate because there is this idea that they were treated like blacks. They were never treated like blacks. They weren't treated better, much better, mm. but they became white because what they did was they joined the police. Mm. And the police's whole function from its onset was as a racist, it was to, uh, to capture uh, escaped slaves, to massacre the indigenous population, and of course, to keep the women in place. So funny enough, the white women were at most risk were from white men, mm. but you obviously had to have a boogeyman and use a black man. Yeah. And the second thing is to use in modern day Ireland, using again, the same sort of uh, tropes and the same rhetoric that we're having the weaponized whiteness. So places where it's are multicultural, the far right are, are continually on social media showing videos to try and stir up, you know, you know and take, twisting every single episode. So we had the incident in Sligo, we had whatever, and it's all the foreigners coming in, never mind the fact that the Irish went and massacred people in Australia, in Canada, in every other country they went into, but let's forget about that. But nowadays, you know, you get a couple of people coming over here and we have the whole rhetoric. Yeah. And it's very interesting because the whole book is actually weaponized whiteness. And I think this is the issue that people often think about it's all guns and masks, and that is, that's, yeah. that's the definition of how uh, Europe you got the word, they didn't negotiate it, they robbed it. Uh, and mm -hmm. and the, the last thing is, uh, but now they're using the, the stories to change it, so people actually believe it, and that's what you said, that yeah. they actually believe the only yeah. enemy was communism, whereas, you know, the actual enemy, you know, they're looking, they need to look yeah. in the mirror and see, you know, they won't see a reflection. Yeah. Um, Great. I, can I just have yeah, one last okay. thing? One and it's quick. because it's really important. A few weeks ago, mm. a certain old privileged woman died. Mm. Uh, and Lizzie's in a box, and the funny thing was Twitter and a couple of other social media sites went mad. And some Irish individuals did put up a comment about the truth about what, you know, the British monarchy and Ireland's uh, relationship. But there was amazing how many people seemed to forget 
uh, that what happened in Ireland was as a direct result of British rule and British monarchy. Yeah. And it I just amazes me that... Similar to views to that in India, actually, as well. There was a lot of reaction. Yeah, but the yeah. death threats went to black people. Okay, the, la the lady there. Yeah, and now I'll come to you guys. Just this lady here first. The... Hi, quick question. Yeah. Uh, what effect do you think it had on the popularity of the book that it came out just as the Second World War had broken out as well? Okay, good yeah. point. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Or oh, do you want to do multiple questions? No, no, okay. you can take that one and then... Um, yeah, no, thanks for asking that. So absolutely, I mean, and that's, of course, why, why I say that, the, that I thought the context of fascism was so important to it. Mm. Um, it's absolutely a book that... And people were very, very conscious of it. It was film, It finished filming as the war broke out. So um, Selznick wrapped uh, at the end of August, you know, um, 1939. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, and of course, it's, um, it's, it's a British cast, right? Vivian Lee and, and um, uh, Leslie Howard as Britain declares war um, days after they wrapped. So, um, and, it, and, it, um, and it emerged during the phony war. So it was, it's, World War II was crucial to it. And one of the things I go into in the book is, is about its reception during the war because um, I think it's, it's actually really telling about this, this, the question that I raise about, about where it sits in relationship to fascism and to American fascism and European fascism. Um, and one of the things is that it was incredibly popular in the French underground. So the French resistance loved Gone with the Wind because it's a story about an occupying army. It's about resisting an occupying army. And it is about uh, resilience and defiance and, um, and, and you know, maintaining your culture and your way of life at all costs. Um, and the New York Times wrote this review during the London Blitz saying that it's just like the people in the Blitz and the burning of Atlanta was like the London yeah. Blitz. But the thing I point out in the book is that there's a little problem with this, which is that unless you think that Abraham Lincoln is on the side of fascism, then what you're actually talking about is a story that's defending, it's, it's basically about the burning of Berlin and, and unrepentant Nazis who will keep their way of life no matter what. Unless you think the North was on the immoral side in, in the Civil War. And Again, so it, it's like it, you were saying, it's turning everything, it's making everything it's the opposite. Always, it's always flipping it. And um, there are reports that Hitler loved Gone with the Wind, although we can't, we can't, uh, we can't stand it up completely, but I do go into them because it's too good not to. Um, but okay, so the man in the check shirt here and then his friend three seats up after that, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah, for a fascinating talk. In the wake of the uh, taking down of the Colston statue in Bristol and the, oh, yeah. uh, the desire to do the same to Dundas in Edinburgh, yeah. what's your standpoint? Should these statues be taken down, consigned either into a river, into a museum at best, or should they remain up uh, with appropriate signage to explain exactly what happened? Yeah. And, and probably the same token, what would you do with the film? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for that. It's a really important question. And as you say, it's very, it's very relevant. And in the US as well, all of these debates about what to do with Confederate memorials. In the US, the Confederate memorials are mostly not in cemeteries where you might expect a memorial to the fallen dead to be. They're mostly in front of courthouses. They're mostly in front of police stations. They're in front of government buildings. They are, and, and, and they are insurrectionists uh, being commemorated in front of US government's official buildings. My view is they should not be there because they were insurrectionists. Now, what we do with them those statues, um, and you suggested in your question what I think we should do. I think we should put them in a museum. That's mm -hmm. exactly what I think we should do with them. And, um, and I think that then you discuss that whole history. You don't obliterate it, because then you're whitewashing it all over again. People will just forget. So you keep it there, and you talk about the evolution of history. And also the fact that um, many of these statues, and Colston is another good example, went up way after the fact. And they went up to make political statements at a different time. Yeah. Um, and so, again, in the U.S., a lot of these were put up during Reconstruction to put black people back in their place. A lot of them were put up during the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 1960s. As Martin Luther King was gaining ground, they started putting up white supremacist statues. So, no, I do not think that those should still be up. Um, in terms of the, the film and the book, um, similarly, I think we can't... People keep asking me if I think we should cancel it. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I'm a professor of literature, so I'm not in the business of canceling books. Mm. I'm not in the business of censoring books. Um, and again, this is, you know, we're seeing all over the U.S. right now, the right wing, the Tommy Tuberville movement, all of the, the Trumpist 
um, uh, Republicans are banning books again, and um, and there are these long lists of, of book banning. So again, you know, if, whatever Tommy Tuberville believes, I believe the opposite. So if he's <laughs> going to if he's going to ban books, I I'm I'm pro books. I've always been pro books. Um, so look, so I think that what we but it's the same answer really is I think we have to engage with it. That's the point. That's why I wrote this mm. book is is, you know, I didn't write an entire book to say we shouldn't think about Gone with the Wind anymore, but to say we should think harder about Gone with the Wind. We need to recognize what it's doing and to think about the way that it has shaped our history and our reality. Now, I know that that's ambitious, and I know it's probably unrealistic, idealistic, certainly, um, but I'm going to keep hoping and to say that we need to engage with our history, uh, all of our histories, in, comp in much more complex and plural and frankly, mature ways, because we have very infantile views of our own history, that if anything bad happened, if anybody says anything bad about us, it's a playground <laughs> politics. You can't hurt my feelings. You can't say anything bad about my ancestor. Like, why not? As far as I'm concerned, say all the bad things about my ancestors you like. You know, I mean, it's no skin off my nose. And, 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 but we have to tell the truth. That's the goal, right, is to try. And truth is hard. Truth is difficult to ascertain. It's, again, it's plural. It's complex. It's slippery. It's not the same as fact, but it has a relationship to fact. Um, and it's harder than lies. Lies are easy. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think, you know, we're all seeing what's happening to democracies that are all across the West, as we've just said, um, that are losing a good faith relationship to fact and to truth and are diving into the, the cynicism of lies. And it's very, very dangerous. Okay, so this man here, and yeah. then I'll take one or two as well at the same time. Yeah, just a, a, a brief, I have a whole list of stuff I could talk to you about. But yeah. my main question is, um, what's people's understanding of what happened to Re Republic of Texas and the struggle to establish that or to nab it as um, a land grab? Okay, I'll take two more yeah. just so we can run them together. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, okay, here, yeah. Uh, and then you know after that, yeah. I'm just wondering what the reaction to your book has been in the United States. Oh, good question. And then this man here at the, yeah. Hi, um, you mentioned it earlier, but I was just curious to know, you said the flip in the parity positions was a red herring. Thank I would just you. really love to hear you expand on that. Thank you. Okay, so Texas reaction to the book and red, red herrings. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but you have to remember, because I forgot what I said was a red herring and I couldn't hear you. I, I think well, we were Which talking part? about there were Republican Party and how the Democrats... Oh, the flip. Yeah, the flip. Gotcha, yeah. yes. Yeah. I can definitely do that. Yeah. Um, so, it was, yeah, it was a red herring at that point, but it's actually really important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, how it's doing in the US, I don't know because it isn't out there yet. Um, oh. it's, it's only just come out this summer here, and it is making its way out in the US. So, I just have individual reader reaction um, at present. I expect that there will be people who will hate it you know, um, to its core. But so far, the reaction has been very positive, which has been, which has been nice. And, um, and people have been sending me nice emails and things. And you sometimes think that people only ever send you hate mail. And so I can, I can report that people also sometimes take the time to send nice emails, which is very nice. So, so the uh, anecdotal initial reaction has been good, but I fully expect to, um, to, to be called a traitor and everything else, um, which, you know, it's not the first time. Um, <laughs> And, um, and I, for those, because, you know, they're all, they're all, you know, these racist eugenicists who are, and they're all nativists, right? And so I have a really great comeback because my family came over on the Mayflower. So for those people, I guess, <laughs> to just go, I came over on the Mayflower, shut up. Um, if you believe in nativism, I win, you know? So, um, well, that just makes you a class traitor. I know, you know exactly, exactly. Works. But I'm perfectly yeah. willing to play the game <laughs> if I have to, you know, to shut them up, put um, them in their place. So um, Texas. So, um, well, let me do the flip first. And okay, then, and then so, so the flip is that basically it's the, it's the, the story of 20th century American politics is the story of the flip between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And they flipped over their relationship to civil rights over the course of the civil rights movement. And, um, and basically what happened was after the civil rights movement, so in the 60s, the Republican Party decided very cynically and very consciously, and we know this because they wrote letters, again, as I was saying earlier about white supremacists being explicit about it, um, and they admitted it. Um, they had what they called the Southern strategy, which was that they would, as the, um, the white South lost, uh, um, uh, um, uh, lost its, not faith is the wrong word, but it, it, they, the, the Democrat party lost the white South as it became the party of civil rights. Yeah. And so the Republicans very cynically decided to, to um, foster white supremacist grievances and to, um, and to basically you know, bring them in that way. And, and it worked. Um, and, and there's a, I, took, I go into it a bit in the book to explain that um, and where the evidence is, because 
these are things. But so basically, if you study 20th century American history, you know, as an undergrad, this is basically what you'll be studying is how that happened and why. And it's, it's you know, it's kind of as if the story of 20th century American politics is they flipped in their respective positions to civil rights because the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln and the party of, of equality. Mm -hmm. The Republic of Texas, man, that is a whole other book, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but um, but I, I, it's threatening to secede again, and I'm afraid as somebody from Chicago, I kind of look at it and I go, oh, well, just go then. I mean, just stop, <laughs> you know, stop crying wolf. Off you go. We'll see you later. Um, yeah. You and your guns, you know, um, sayonara. So no, that so the, it's really um, what I would say in this context, though, is it is about the the this, one of the big struggles in American politics and American history is how do we reconcile these libertarian. Um, ideologies that, that some people think are baked into American politics with a concept of unity. Um, and, you know, they've been showing, there have been these polls lately, um, uh, people are being asked what they think the American dream is, and when I was growing up, the answer to that question was always a White House and a picket fence, you know, or immigration, but it was about opportunity, upward social mobility. Increasingly, particularly in the Republican Party, their answer to that question is one word, freedom. That's what they think the American dream is. And their, and their interpretation of freedom is hardcore libertarianism. And it's their freedom to carry their guns, and it's their freedom to kill each other, and it's their freedom to you know, do whatever the hell they want. And the Republic of Texas, in its mythologies and in its politics, has tended to, um, to kind of embody that, that libertarian strain in, in American life. But you know, what's happening in the United States right now is that um, if people think it's, they still think of politics as being either red state or blue state or coastal and middle. And again, I'm from the middle. Um, and that's wrong. Increasingly, we can see this in, in, um, in the electoral demographics. It's, it's cities versus, uh, versus rural areas, and that includes cities in the South, and that includes cities in Texas, which is why when people start making noise about secession, they could do it with the Republic of Texas 150 years ago. They can't do it now because the cities are liberal, and it's the, it's the exurban areas that, that are red. And, and how we reconcile that is a, is a big and complicated question. But the history of the Republic of Texas, as I say, is a kind of whole other, a whole other lecture. Anyone else? Anyone? Takers? Yeah. Um, just you were talking about the division in U.S. society and that it has always been there. But why has it suddenly come to the fore? Is it something to do with the election of uh, Barack Obama as, as president? Yes. The backlash. <laughs> That's, I, that, I'll give my shortest answer of the night. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, no, it, absolutely. It's a racial backlash uh, in part. Um, but again, it's about the ways in which um, capitalism in America is racialized. And... Um, and the ways in which particularly minority white power in America is, I'm oh, sorry, minority power is also racialized. Um, but we haven't talked enough, we talked a little bit about feminism, but we haven't yeah. talked enough about patriarchy, which is a really important part of this story as well. And, um, and of course, the, the other big division in the US right now is over uh, what just happened to women's rights over the summer with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision. So the other thing that has inflamed division in the US right now, so race is a really, really important part of it. The determination of the Republicans to cling on to power, although they are a minority party, they do not enjoy majority support. They simply do not, numerically, um, uh, is, is a really important part of it. Their willingness to throw out the rule of law and democratic norms in order to cling on to power at any cost, and to racialize that, to use race to cling on to power, to leverage race uh, uh, in the backlash against Obama. Um, there's uh, no question about that. Um, the, whether the divisions about women will drive uh, women to the midterms is mm -hmm. an open and very urgent question. They are seeing that women are registering, new voters, women registering to vote for the first time in record numbers in the last two months. Record numbers, women and, racing sorry, Sarah, to register. To that extent, is the overturning of Roe versus Wade Sadly, maybe one of the best things that could have happened at this point. I think it was. I think it had to happen. It was. It, the problem was that it was a weak law. It was. It was morally the right law, right? But but legislatively, it did not have a strong legal foundation, and that was always a problem. So they're always going after it. Um, and yes, I think it's going to be one of those things they've overreached, and I think yeah. they're going to find that out the hard way. But the other thing that is fomenting division is the rise of religiosity. The thing that people need to understand in thinking about Trumpism and all of this stuff with the Republicans, even with climate change right now, Hurricane Ian, we just saw it in Florida the other day. They, and and I, I was joking about this on Twitter, but it's, a, but, it's a, but it's a serious point too. If you write a book called The Wrath to Come, you start learning about apocalyptic millenarianism. Um, 
which is the people who think that all of this stuff is happening because the end times are nigh. They think, they know that Trump is terrible. They're not duped. Yeah. They know that Trump is terrible. They think he's part of God's plan yeah. to bring it all down. They think he can be part of the, whatever, whatever they think he is with the sign of the beast or something. They, I mean, literally, they do. And they think that, um, they think that the hurricane, they just said that the hurricane was, this is all part of God's plan. They believe that climate change is real. They may even believe that it's man-made, but they believe it's all part of God's plan. This is the apocalypse. It's at hand and they want it. Um, so it, that's a real problem. <laughs> and by the way, against that, liberal Democrats, that division is not going to. We're not going. I'm not going to. I'm not going to reconcile with those yeah. people. So we have a problem. That millenarianism uh, was all invented by an Irishman <laughs> called uh, Thomas Darby, <laughs> and uh, he was one of the early Plymouth Brethren who came up with all that hokum. It's great stuff. There's yeah. An in our time episode on it that I recommend. Yeah. And yeah. In our time with Nick Guyot, the yeah. one with Nicholas Guyot. Yeah. 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 His, yeah. And by the way, Sarah's episode of In Our Time on the Great Gap. Gatsby is amazing, and I think any academic who survives Melvin Bragg <laughs> deserves some kind of a badge. So look, it's, it's just past eight. Does anybody else want to get in, uh, or are we done? OK, great. Listen, thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. And a huge thank you to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much.